So, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I have read this so many times, I can't really tell you how many, but I read through it recently with a more critical view um, because I wanted to bring a review to you guys and so I'm now going to give my thoughts on this. But just for those people that are new, or for everyone else actually, because this is the first time we're doing this, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to review the book. We're going to start off with a general talk of how I found it, what I enjoyed and things like that. And then I'm going to take five chapters that I enjoyed and also tell you why, what things in there that were great. And also maybe, maybe some criticism in there as well. And then I'm going to give my final opinion and then I'm going to rate it. Which hopefully you guys don't hate me on. Remember, this is my opinion. Everyone's different. Feel free to tell me what I did wrong, what you guys like down in the comments below. Just make sure they're not angry. <laughs> anyway, the great thing about this book is that it does a brilliant job of setting up the world, especially with certain um, bits of world building, such as Diagon Alley, which is a great one. The fact is, they spend a is hundred over 100 pages before he even gets to Hogwarts and that's because it's all based on Harry's life and they built build up that before introducing you to the wider world with Hogwarts and the school and everything like that <clears throat> not only that it starts off with um, the Dursleys which I thought was a great inclusion rather than what they do in the film because it shows the, like the, the muggle world and then creates a contrast with how different the wizards are before you then enter it. Which I thought was a nice touch. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into the five key chapters that I th think were great. And we're going to start with the first chapter, The Boy Who Lived. This introduces the Dursleys and helps give this image to the reader of what they are actually like so they're not just hated because of their interaction with Harry but also because they as when they begin they're very like prejudiced and they're like horrible people to begin with let alone when you see how the way they treat Harry not only this but it manages to set up characters from later down the line for example when Hagrid um, lands on the motorbike, he explains that he got this from Sirius Black, who's not even used until the third book, uh, which I thought was quite cool. That it just shows the kind of setup that J.K. Rowling went through, especially for books way down the line. Obviously, this one, the connections in here to later ones are very minimal, but as you go through the series, you see a very steep change and, and like see how things have been pieced together and how she's carefully and meticulously planned this series out which is a very nice thing that's one of the things i think is best about the series um we'll switch to this another chapter diagon alley this one is the first proper uh use of world building well all, all of it's really world building but it's the first like proper segment where they show you the magical world and you kind of just become lost in this sense of like mystery. It's, it's brilliant with all the different inclusions of like, it's brilliant because the shops themselves introduce different part of the world. For example, you've got the Quidditch shop, which introduces the sport of Quidditch as well as you've got the way JK Rowling uses for like the robe shop. Madame Malkins introduces Draco and also the houses and yeah and it's, it's brilliant the, the, the bank is great Gringotts um, and for example another, another thing it that J.K. Rowling uses Ollivanders as well um, for example Ollivanders talks about how his parents wants for example 
James's was great for transfiguration, which obviously he then performs a great feat of transfiguration when he turns himself into a stag later. And you just you learn that later down the line, but it's just mentioned um, just previously, which is quite cool. The third chapter that I'm going to talk about is The Potions Master, which is a chapter which is great because it introduces all the teachers for the first time. Obviously McGonagall and Hagrid are already there, but it's the other teachers like Flitwick and then also Snape, which is one of the best written characters in here. Um, but not only that, it's another example of J.K. Rowling's kind of planning. For example, when Snape is questioning the, the kids before they've even had their first lesson, and he's trying to embarrass Harry by making making it seem like he doesn't know anything. Uh, the questions he asks, for example, one talks about a bazaar, I think that's how you say it, which Harry has to use later down the line, um, as well as the, is it the wolf's worm? I can't, mm, I can't remember. But basically it talks about like worm, wolf's, the wolf's bane potion, which obviously in the third book, that's what Lupin has to take. And then also, um, one of, it's something to do with one of the plants. It, it's got a link to lilies, which obviously shows how he, um, like had feelings for his mother, like, but it's just something in the first book that's mentioned. And only once you finish the series, do you realize that that was actually, um, like a great, it was him taking his anger out on Harry um, about what happened to his mother. And it's just things like that, which I thought a great, a very great way of like set up. So if we continue on, we've got the uh, chapter, which I like is Quidditch, because Quidditch is my, is a great sport. Um, a bit questionable in terms of points, but we'll s skip past that. Um, but it also is a great example of how J.K. Rowling manages to hide certain things within her book, especially as the genre itself is it's a it's a fantasy book because it's magic and people. But mo it's if you think about it, if you take away the magic, it's it's a mystery like who done it kind of thing because it's all about who's going to steal the philosopher's stone. And for that whole suit, that whole book, you're thinking it's oh, it's gonna be it's Snape because even the main characters tell you that it's Snape. And in the end, for spoiler warning, it's Quill, and he is joined by Voldemort. Um, but in that chapter, Quidditch, Hermione goes to stop Snape from jinxing Harry's broom, and just at the end of a sentence talks about how she knocks Quirrell over on her way to stop Snape. And it's half a sentence. But it's things like that, which is great because at the end of the novel, you do, you're not left with, oh, how could it be him? You look, you can look back and see that there's quite a lot of evidence that it might have been Quirrell. You just weren't looking because the main characters themselves being a kind of unreliable narrator here, keep saying, oh, it's Snape, it's... and you think that they are right, and it's it's just a great way of it being done. And for the last chapter, the last chapter in the book is also my last chapter I'm gonna talk about, which is the man with the two faces. This one shows that initial confrontation between Harry and Voldemort, where obviously where Harry actually is aware of what's going on because Obviously, it happened before when he was a baby. Um, but it also is an example of Harry's like capability in terms of he's not just the boy who survived when he was a baby by accident. He is uh, worth that, that kind of like Gryffindor brave kind of trait. Um, and not only that, there is an issue with this kind of chapter, which I'm... It's kind of annoying, but I don't... It's more the fact that Harry goes to the final, like, the final battle in that, and ends up retrieving the stone, 
and then give it, and then obviously making it easier for Voldemort to then gain it, which is a bit annoying. It would make more sense if how um, the stone was retrieved afterwards, because it kind of puts a dent in Harry in terms of like he made it easier for Voldemort. If he hadn't been there, I don't know if Voldemort would have been able to get the stone or not. It was, that, that just felt a bit weird to me. But other than that, the chapter's really good. And that ending bit with the talk between Harry and Dumbledore kind of shows that respect that both have for each other. Harry seeing him as like, an old, like this old, older mentor who is wise and all-knowing, but is also like kind. Whereas Dumbledore sees Harry as not just a child, but as, a, as an equal. As he says, I think... He mentions um, that he doesn't want to treat him like a child, but until he's old enough to understand, he's not. He, d he doesn't feel ready to tell him about certain things about Voldemort and things like that. But it's but he still treats him with respect, like telling him that oh, I know this is not what you want to hear, but you're gonna have to wait. So my final analysis of the book is that it is a great introduction to the series. J.K. Rowling clearly has done some work in terms of uh, setting things up. She's aware that she wants it to be a series. She, and you can see in interviews that she says things like this. But there's some like subtle details, especially on a reread, is uh, like, yeah, you notice some things that stand out, such as, like I said, Sirius Black at the beginning being just, just mentioned, but you know, if you've read the rest of the books, that he is a character that comes into play later down the line. Um. Yeah, like I said, she plans ahead and this is a great book because it captures the kind of magic that she starts to set up. And it doesn't open... Because I've seen some books that kind of overdo it with the whole world building thing. It confuses me. It's it's that kind of like learning curve. As this is... Was originally she wrote it for kids. Although it's... Everyone loves the books. But she originally wrote it for kids. The learning curve for the world as it's rooted in our own kind of, well, our own society, such a, yeah, because everything's, it's not like a completely new world, it's, um, it's, well, it's Earth, but with magical stuff intertwined. Um, the learning curve isn't that steep, which is good for a young reader, but also if you're just wanting to get into the characters, um, it's a great thing. Yes, so I'm going to score this a 4 out of 5. I can't give it a 5 out of 5 because like I mentioned with the bit at the end, as well as some other um, bits and pieces that could have easily been changed, um, it's not, obviously it's not perfect, but a 4 out of 5 is good. I'm giving it a 4 out of 5. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this review. I will be giving a review of the second book later down the line. I have finished it. I am already halfway through the third one, so I'll get these up as soon as I can. But other than that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.